Section 55 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3, Section 55. Excerpts from History of the United States by George Bancroft, Part 2. Wolf on the Plains of Abraham, from History of the United States. But in the meantime, Wolf applied himself intently to reconnoitering the north shore above Quebec. Nature had given him good eyes, as well as a warmth of temper, to follow first impressions. He himself discovered the cove, which now bears his name, where the bending promontories almost form a basin, with a very narrow margin, over which the hill rises precipitously. He saw the path that wound up the steep, though so narrow, that two men could hardly march in it abreast, and he knew, by the number of tents which he counted on the summit, that the Canadian post which guarded it could not exceed a hundred. Here he resolved to land his army by surprise. To mislead the enemy, his troops were kept far above the town, while Saunders, as if an attack was intended at Beauport, set Cook, the great mariner, with others, to sound the water and plant buoys along that shore. The day and night on the twelfth were employed in preparations. The autumn evening was bright, and the general, under the clear starlight, visited his stations, to make his final inspection, and utter his last words of encouragement. As he passed from ship to ship, he spoke to those in the boat with him of the poet Gray, and the elegy in a country churchyard. I, said he, would prefer being the author of that poem to the glory of beating the French to-morrow. And, while the oars struck the river, as it rippled in the silence of the night air, under the flowing tide, he repeated, The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth ever gave, await alike the inevitable hour, the path of glory lead but to the grave. Every officer knew his appointed duty, when, at one o'clock in the morning of the 13th of September, Wolf, Monckton, and Murray, and about half the forces set off in boats, and using neither sails nor oars, glided down with the tide. In three quarters of an hour the ships followed, and though the night had become dark, aided by the rapid current, they reached the cove just in time to cover the landing. Wolf and the troops with him leaped on shore, the light infantry who found themselves borne by the current a little below the entrenched path, clambered up the steep hill, staying themselves by the roots and buffs of the maple and spruce and ash trees that covered the precipitous declivity, and after a little firing dispersed the picket which guarded the height. The rest ascended safely by the pathway. A battery of four guns on the left was abandoned to Colonel Ho. When Townshend's division disembarked, the English had already gained one of the roads to Quebec, and, Advancing in front of the forest, Wolf stood at daybreak with his invincible battalions on the plains of Abraham, the battlefield of the Celtic and Saxon races. "'It can be but a small party, come to burn a few houses and retire,' said Montcalm, in amazement as the news reached him in his entrenchments, the other side of the St. Charles. But, obtaining better information, then he cried, they have at last got to the weak side of this miserable garrison. We must give battle and crush them before midday. And before ten, the two armies, equal in numbers, each being composed of less than five thousand men, were ranged in presence of one another for battle. The English, not easily accessible from intervening shallow ravines and rail fences, were all regulars, perfect in discipline, terrible in their fearless enthusiasm, thrilling with pride at their morning's success, commanded by a man whom they obeyed with confidence and love. 
They doomed and devoted Montcalm had that wolf had called, but five weak French battalions, of less than two thousand men, mingled with disorderly peasantry, formed on commanding ground. The French had three little pieces of artillery, the English one or two. The two armies cannonaded each other for nearly an hour, when Montcalm, having summoned de Bougenville to his aid, and dispatched messenger after messenger for de Vaudreau, who had fifteen hundred men at the camp, to come up before he should be driven from the ground, endeavoured to flank the British, and crowd them down the high bank of the river. Wolfe counteracted the movement by detaching Townshend with Amherst regiment, and afterward a part of the Royal Americans, who formed on the left with a double front. Waiting no longer for more troops, Montcalm led the French army impetuously to the attack. The ill-disciplined companies broke, by their precipitation and the unevenness of the ground, and fired by platoons without unity. Their adversaries, especially the 43rd and the 47th, where Moncton stood, of which three men out of four were Americans, received the shock with calmness, and after having, at Wolfe's command, reserved their fire till their enemy was within forty yards, their line began a regular, rapid, and exact discharge of musketry. Montcalm was present everywhere, braving danger, wounded, but cheering by his example. The second in command, de Senezergu, an associate in glory at Ticonderoga, was killed. The brave but untried Canadians, flinching from a hot fire in the open field, began to waver, and so soon as Wolfe, placing himself at the head of the twenty-eighth and the Louisbourg grenadiers, charged with bayonets, they everywhere gave way. Of the English officers, Carleton was wounded, Barret, who fought near Wolfe, received in the head a ball, which made him blind of one eye, and ultimately of both. Wolfe also, as he led the charge, was wounded in the breast, but still pressing forward he received a second ball, and having decided the day, was struck a third time, and mortally in the breast. "'Support me,' he cried to an officer near him. "'Let not my brave fellows see me drop.' He was carried to the rear, and they brought him water to quench his thirst. "'They run, they run,' spoke the officer on whom he leaned. "'Who run?' asked Wolf, as his life was fast ebbing. "'The French,' replied the officer. "'Give way everywhere.' "'What?' cried the expiring hero. "'Do they run already? "'Go, one of you, to Colonel Burton.' Bid him march Webb's regiment with all speed to Charles River to cut off the fugitives. Four days before he had looked forward to early death with dismay. Now God be praised, I die happy. These were his words as his spirit escaped in the blaze of his glory. Night, silence, the rushing tide, veteran discipline, the sure inspiration of genius, had been his allies. His battlefield, high over the ocean river, was the grandest theater of illustrious deeds. His victory, one of the most momentous in the annals of mankind, gave to the English tongue and the institutions of the Germanic race the unexplored and seemingly infinite west and south. He crowded into a few hours actions that would have given luster to length of life, and filling his days with greatness, completed it before its noon. The Appleton and Company, New York. Lexington, from History of the United States. Day came in all the beauty of an early spring. The trees were budding, the grass growing rankly at full months before its time, the bluebird and the robin gladdening the genial season, and calling forth the beams of the sun, which on that morning shone with the warmth of summer. But distress and horror gathered over the inhabitants of the peaceful town. There, on the green, lay in death the grey-haired and the young. The grassy field was red, with the innocent blood of their brethren slain, crying unto God for vengeance from the ground. Seven of the men of Lexington were killed, nine wounded, a quarter part of all who stood in arms on the green. 
these are the village heroes, who were more than of noble blood, proving by their spirit that they were of a race divine. They gave their lives in testimony to the rights of mankind, bequeathing to their country an assurance of success in the mighty struggle which they began. Their names are held in grateful remembrance, and the expanding millions of their countrymen renew and multiply their praise from generation to generation. They fulfilled their duty not from the accidental impulse of the moment. Their action was the slowly ripened fruit of providence and of time. The light that led them on was combined of rays from the whole history of the race, from the traditions of the Hebrews in the grey of the world's morning, from the heroes and sages of republican Greece and Rome, from the example of him who died on the cross for the life of humanity, from the religious creed which proclaimed the divine presence in man, and on this truth, as in a lifeboat, floated the liberties of nations over the dark flood of the Middle Ages, from the customs of the Germans transmitted out of their forests to the councils of Saxon England, from the burning faith and courage of Martin Luther, from trust in the inevitable universality of God's sovereignty, as taught by Paul of Tarsus and Augustine, through Calvin and the divines of New England, from the avenging fierceness of the Puritans, who dashed the mitre on the ruins of the throne, from the bold descent and creative self-assertion of the earliest emigrants to Massachusetts, from the statesmen who made, and the philosophers who expounded, the revolution of England, from the liberal spirit and analyzing inquisitiveness of the eighteenth century, from the cloud of witnesses of all the ages, to the reality and the rightfulness of human freedom. All the countries bowed themselves, from the recesses of the past, to cheer in their sacrifice the lowly men who proved themselves worthy of their forerunners, and whose children rise up and call them blessed. Heedless of his own danger, Samuel Adams, with the voice of a prophet, exclaimed, Oh, what a glorious morning is this! For he saw his country's independence hastening on, and like Columbus in the tempest, knew that the storm did but bear him the more swiftly towards the undiscovered world. D. Appleton Company, New York Washington, from History of the United States then, on the 15th of June, it was voted to appoint a general. Thomas Johnson, of Maryland, nominated George Washington, and as he had been brought forward, at the particular request of the people of New England, he was elected by ballot unanimously. Washington was then forty-three years of age. In stature he a little exceeded six feet. His limbs were sinewy and well-proportioned, his chest broad, his figure stately, blending dignity of presence with ease. His robust constitution had been tried and invigorated by his early life in the wilderness, the habit of occupation out of doors, and rigid temperance, so that few equalled him in strength of arm, or power of endurance, or noble horsemanship. His complexion was florid, his hair dark brown, his head in its shape perfectly round. His broad nostrils seemed formed to give expression and escape to scornful anger. His eyebrows were rayed and finely arched. His dark blue eyes, which were deeply set, had an expression of resignation and an earnestness that was almost pensiveness. His forehead was sometimes marked with thought, but never with inquietude. His countenance was mild and pleasing and full of benignity. At eleven years old, Left an orphan to the care of an excellent but unlettered mother, he grew up without learning. Of arithmetic and geometry he acquired just knowledge enough to be able to practice measuring land, but all his instruction at school taught him not so much as the orthography or rules of grammar of his own tongue. His culture was altogether his own work, and he was in the strictest sense a self-made man, yet from his early life he never seemed uneducated. At sixteen he went into the wilderness as the surveyor, and for three years continued the pursuit, where the forests trained him, 
in meditative solitude, to freedom and largeness of mind, and nature revealed to him her obedience to serene and silent laws. In his intervals from toil he seemed always to be attracted to the best men, and to be cherished by them. Fairfax, his employer, an Oxford scholar, already aged, became his fast friend. He read little, but with close attention. Whatever he took in hand he applied himself to with care, and his papers, which have been preserved, show how he almost imperceptibly gained the power of writing correctly, always expressing himself with clearness and directness, often with felicity of language and grace. When the frontiers on the west became disturbed, he at nineteen was commissioned as adjutant-general with the rank of major. At twenty-one he went as the envoy of Virginia to the Council of Indian Chiefs on the Ohio and to the French officers near Lake Erie. Fame waited upon him from his youth, and no one of his colony was so much spoken of. He conducted the first military expedition from Virginia that crossed the Alleghanes. Braddock selected him as an aide, and he was the only man who came out of the disastrous defeat near the Monongahela, with increased reputation, which extended to England. The next year, when he was but four-and-twenty, the great esteem in which he was held in Virginia, and his real merit, led the lieutenant governor of Maryland to request that he might be commissioned and appointed second in command of the army designed to march to the Ohio, and surely the commander-in-chief heard the proposal with great satisfaction and pleasure, for he knew no provincial officer upon the continent to whom he would so readily give that rank as to Washington. In 1758 he acted under Forbes as a brigadier, and but for him that the general would never have crossed the mountains. Courage was so natural to him that it was hardly spoken of to his praise. No one ever at any moment of his life discovered in him the least shrinking in danger, and he had a hardihood of daring which escaped notice, because it was so enveloped by superior calmness and wisdom. His address was most easy and agreeable, his step firm and graceful, his air neither grave nor familiar. He was as cheerful as he was spirited, frank and communicative in the society of friends, fond of the fox-chase and the dance, often sportive in his letters, and liked a hearty laugh. His smile, writes Castellux, was always the smile of benevolence. The joyousness of disposition remained to the last, though the vastness of his responsibilities was soon to take from him the right of displaying the impulsive qualities of his nature, and the weight which he was to bear up was to overlay and repress his gaiety and openness. His hand was liberal, giving quietly and without observation, as though he was ashamed of nothing but being discovered in doing good. He was kindly and compassionate, and of lively sensibility to the sorrows of others, so that if his country had only needed a victim for its relief, he would have willingly offered himself as a sacrifice. But while he was prodigal of himself, he was considerate for others, ever parsimonious of the blood of his countrymen. He was prudent in the management of his private affairs, purchased rich lands from the Mohawk Valley to the flats of the Kanawha, and improved his fortune by the correctness of his judgment. But as a public man he knew no other aim than the good of his country, and in the hour of his country's poverty he refused personal emolument for his service. His faculties were so well balanced and combined that his constitution, free from excess, was tempered evenly with all the elements of activity, and his mind resembled a well-ordered commonwealth, his passions, which had the intensest vigor, owned allegiance to reason, and with all the fiery quickness of his spirit, his impetuous and massive will was held in check by consummate judgment. He had in his composition a calm, which gave him in moments of highest excitement the power of self-control, and enabled him to excel in patience, even when he had most cause for disgust. Washington was offered a command 
when there was little to bring out the unorganized resources of the continent but his own influence and authority was connected with the people by the most frail most attenuated scarcely discernible threads yet vehement as was his nature impassioned as was his courage he so retained his ardor that he never failed continuously to exert the attractive power of that influence and never exerted it so sharply as to break its force in secrecy he was unsurpassed but his secrecy had the character of prudent reserve not of cunning or concealment his great natural power of vigilance had been developed by his life in the wilderness his understanding was lucid and his judgment accurate so that his conduct never betrayed hurry or confusion no detail was too minute for his personal inquiry and continued supervision and at the same time he comprehended events in their widest aspects and relations he never seemed above the object that engaged his attention and he was always equal without an effort to the solution of the highest questions even when there existed no precedents to guide his decision in the perfection of the reflective powers which he used habitually he had no peer in this way he never drew to himself admiration for the possession of any one quality in excess never made in counsel any one suggestion that was sublime but impracticable never in action took to himself the praise or the blame of undertakings astonishing in conception but beyond his means of execution it was the most wonderful accomplishment of this man that placed upon the largest theatre of events at the head of the greatest revolution in human affairs he never failed to observe all that was possible and at the same time to bound his aspirations by that which was possible a slight tinge in his character perceptible only to the close observer revealed the region from which he sprung and he might be described as the best specimen of manhood as developed in the south but his qualities were so faultlessly proportioned that his whole country rather claimed him as its choicest representative the most complete expression of all its attainments and aspirations he studied his country and conformed to it. His countrymen felt that he was the best type of America, and rejoiced in it, and were proud of it. They lived in his life, and made his success and his praise their own. Profoundly impressed with confidence in God's providence, and exemplary in his respect for the forms of public worship, no philosopher of the eighteenth century was more firm in the support of freedom of religious opinion none more remote from bigotry but belief in god and trust in his overruling power formed the essence of his character divine wisdom not only illumines the spirit it inspires the will washington was a man of action and not of theory or words his creed appears in his life not in his professions which burst from him very rarely and only at those great moments of crisis in the fortunes of his country when earth and heaven seemed actually to meet and his emotions became too intense for suppression but his whole being was one continued act of faith in the eternal intelligent moral order of the universe integrity was so completely the law of his nature that a planet would sooner have shot from its sphere that he have departed from his uprightness which was so constant that it often seemed to be almost impersonal his integrity was the most pure his justice the most inflexible i have ever known writes jefferson no motives of interest or consanguinity of friendship or hatred being able to bias his decision they say of giotto that he introduced goodness into the art of painting Washington carried it with him to the camp and the cabinet, and established a new criterion of human greatness. The purity of his will confirmed his fortitude, and as he never faltered in his faith in virtue, he stood fast by that which he knew to be just. Free from illusions, never dejected by the apprehension of the difficulties and perils that went before him, 
and drawing the promise of success from the justice of his cause. Hence he was persevering, leaving nothing unfinished, devoid of all taint of obstinacy in his firmness, seeking and gladly receiving advice, but immovable in his devotedness to right. Of a retiring modesty and habitual reserve, his ambition was no more than the consciousness of his power, and was subordinate to his sense of duty. He took the foremost place, for he knew from inborn magnanimity that it belonged to him, and he dared not withhold the service required of him, so that, with all his humility, he was by necessity the first, though never for himself or for private ends. He loved fame, the approval of coming generations, the good opinion of his fellow men of his own time, and he desired to make his conduct coincide with his wishes. But not fear of censure, nor the prospect of applause could tempt him to swerve from rectitude, and the praise which he coveted was the sympathy of that moral sentiment which exists in every human breast and goes forth only to the welcome of virtue. There have been soldiers who have achieved mightier victories in the field, and made conquests more nearly corresponding to the boundlessness of selfish ambition, statesmen, who have been connected with more startling upheavals of society. But it is the greatness of Washington that in public trusts he used power solely for the public good, that he was the life and moderator and stay of the most momentous revolution in human affairs, its moving impulse and its restraining power. This also is the praise of Washington, that never in the tide of time has any man lived who had in so great a degree the almost divine faculty to command the confidence of his fellow men and rule the willing. Wherever he became known, in his family, his neighborhood, his county, his native state, the continent, the camp, civil life, among the common people, in foreign courts, throughout the civilized world, and even among the savages, he, beyond all other men, had the confidence of his kind. D. Appleton and Company, New York End of section 55 End of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3